Hello. Hi. Looking How good. Are How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Very good. Nice to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while, hasn't it? Even before all of this, it's been a long time since we've had a chat. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but it was some show somewhere. I can't remember where. Belgium, maybe? I don't know. I th probably Switzerland, I think. I think we did quite a lot of time on the uh, Charles Hoffer stand together. That's right. We did indeed. Yes. So have you had a busy day today? Are you working or are you furloughed? Or... No, I'm, I'm working at the moment. So I've been working from home, which is has its challenges as a global brand ambassador. Speaking of there, Shelton. Hi, Shelton. Mate. How are you doing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that has its challenges. And uh, I've also, once I finished work tonight, I've been building a fence. So uh, it's all cool. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, uh, for the last three months, I've been like a drunk Alan Titchmarsh, you know. <laughs> I know. That is quite a good description. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you're not a drunk Alan Titchmarsh, you're a drunk Delia Smith. Everyone's learning to cook and bake at the moment. So I know. I remember the first few weeks of lockdown, there was banana bread mentality. Like here, we could just move for all the banana breads. I know. We were just buying lots of bananas, thinking that's a good staple to have in the house, and then they all went off. <laughs> yeah, well, my wife, weirdly enough, her, her go-to is banana bread, and it's incredible. But trying to get her to make it, she's always like, oh, I can't be bothered, I can't be bothered. And then it got to a point, I was like, I, I, I think I need a break from banana bread for a couple <laughs> of weeks. I never thought I'd ever say that, but yeah, yeah it got that A way. banana bread detox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. It's strange times, though, isn't it? I just... Um... Bizarre, um, yeah. Is it day, I don't know, 85, 95, 5,095? I don't know. No idea. No idea. I, I, someone pointed out, I think it was maybe like two months in, they said this is a little bit like that week between Christmas and New Year, but without the pubs. <laughs> and that is the best analogy I've heard. For, I wish I remember who said it. So I'd love to uh, reference him for it. But yeah, it just... Yeah. It is true. It feels just like those days where you have no idea what day of the week it is, and all you yeah. do is eat. I mean, I'm, you you have a young family. I have a young family, and you see on on social media and in our WhatsApp groups that you're members of, people that are picking up new skills, learning the guitar, learning to surf, like doing. Oh, I mean, not surf, but whatever you can learn in the house. And I'm right there going picking porridge out of my ear, trying yeah. to just survive the day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oddly enough, this is so bizarre, but uh, so my birthday was just as we shut the distillery down. It was that, oh. that week. And the week before I decided I'm going to, um, I just turned 29 and I said, I want to learn to play guitar by the time I'm 30. Uh -huh. So I actually went and bought a guitar and a week later, everything shut down. So I have had a little bit of uh, time to put towards that, but you know yourself, the, the the kids just want to be playing at it as well. So you, you don't really get a chance. But, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well done. Let, well, in a year then, we'll be listening to your uh, tunes. You'll be joining uh, Not at Andy, this rate. <laughs> Andy Bell's band on Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, pr I'll play the triangle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much for joining me tonight, Scott. It was just... Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I know. It's great to see because uh, uh, you were you, you're probably my inspiration for this a little bit. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, when lockdown happened and there was just, like, people didn't know, were the whiskey festivals going to be cancelled? Were they not? Is it going to be a week? Is it going to be two weeks? Wow, well, what's going to happen? And nobody yeah. knew. But obviously, pretty soon it was evident that the May festivals had to cancel and, and everything had to be shut down. And you, with Roy, who I didn't actually know before, um, and I still don't know him, but I feel like I do because I've been watching him now, uh, set up the lockdown festival so I watched the first one and I think I might have been a bit stalkery because I was like oh great going and I, you just, I, couldn't, I was so dumb and for me that again with a young family so normal life I don't get out much so for me just to sit and see you guys on tv and because we I um, casted it onto my tv and I was sitting in my sofa watching it I just thought it was great so what made you think of this like what what was the idea behind the lockdown festival I think I would love to say that it was some uh, great idea for the world to share, but it was out of selfishness more than anything. Um, so I, we shut down on the 13th of March. That's when the distillery closed. And it was, so we were working from home for a good week, 10 days okay. before lockdown really kicked in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had planned to meet Daryl Haldane from White and Mackay for beer and a pizza at lunchtime and uh, on the following Tuesday. 
and I just messaged saying, I guess this is off. And he said, yeah, it looks like it. I said, it's going to be tough times for us. And he just said, get creative. So I had a wee chat with our team. <laughs> and um, this is when we kicked off the idea of, uh, originally it was meant to be like a one week brand ambassador uh, social media takeover. Mm -hmm. And then what that morphed into was every Tuesday night kind of doing a little nosing and tasting of a tomato product um, mm -hmm. on Instagram Live for maybe 20 minutes. And then every Friday doing what has now become known as our softer side sessions. So yeah, sitting down, with, yeah, brilliant fun. And it, it was really just, for me, it was really just a way to chat about whiskey and to chat to fellow whiskey geeks that I wouldn't otherwise get to see, um, much like this, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I had invited Roy on the show to talk about the whole online whiskey community, which mm -hmm. I was aware of, but only now that I'm engaging with it, I'm really starting to see how big it is, you know? So we were having a few phone calls and I just said, wouldn't it be great if we could uh, just do an online whiskey festival? You know, I was like, I, I'm, I, I was sick of phoning people saying I'm going to have to cancel my trip. I'm going to, I'm not going to make it to this show. And it's the same thing everyone was going through, but I think just it was going to happen. Someone was going to do the first online whiskey festival. It just so happened that we had been locked down for a week before that. So those sort of thoughts were going around. And from th that was on the Wednesday afternoon that I had the phone call with Roy. And by the Friday lunchtime, we had announced it and it was in the press and everything. So, um, as much as it was myself and Roy, there was a huge amount of work behind the scenes from our marketing team at Tomatin and also the marketing teams at all the other distilleries to have that discussion about, you know, this is going to be on Tomatin's channel. Um, are we willing to give up a little bit of ourselves in this sort of thing? But the way I approached it was you stand next to each other at whiskey festivals. Um, if anything, they're more competitive than the show because on the show, everyone's going to get their 15 minutes okay. at a festival it's up to the customer who they go and see. Yeah. So, uh, and that's kind of how it happened. And it was a roaring success. Oh, you were so professional. Like Roy was flying and he was the perfect um, commentator. Like, so yeah. like, his comments were perfect. He didn't have um, like a preference to any of the brands. I just really enjoyed it. And, and you were brilliant as well, Scott. I, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is great. He, he was the natural choice in the same way that if you're launching a product, Charles McLean or Dave Broom are the right people in that environment. But yeah. in this virtual world where Roy's been kicking about for a while and doing a great, great job, he was perfect in that he could not only be a host of sorts, but also has the enthusiasm of a punter that yeah. we, we needed to get across and, uh, and would ask the questions, the tough questions at times. Um, but as well as being impartial, also even on things that were maybe on the on his negative side, he was looking for the positives. He's great at that. So, um, no, I, I, good day. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So well done. And then that that just grew arms and legs. And like you said, you've continued and you've got new ideas. And everybody's doing it now. Look at me. <laughs> I just thought <laughs> I was going a bit bonkers, and I thought I, I missed some of my whiskey bodies. Let's see if we can do something. And it's Instagram I'm using, which is good and bad, but it's quite raw and ready, and it's easy. Um, and it works with me, but I think YouTube is probably a better way of using it. I was speaking so on Friday night. I had a couple of guys in from Italy on the on the conversation, and earlier in the day, I was speaking to Jacopo, and I was just saying, you know, there's a lot of bad has come out over the last couple of months, you know, and there's we're all in this because of it's it's a negative thing, but we've been able to find upshots, and I think. A real upshot for me has been that where I am, I don't have access to a lot of whiskey tastings, you know. Um, I don't have the ability to go to a lot of whiskey festivals as a punter. And I would like to do that because, yes, it's my job, but a busman's holiday when you're a whiskey ambassador is not a bad holiday. So yeah. but I don't get to go to that many tastings. But now, with everybody being online, you can tune into them all around the world. And it's fantastic. Um, I know. And on the working side of it, being able to have uh, breakfast with my wife and son and then do a bar training in Mexico at lunchtime, it's actually quite a good way of working. So, uh, But oh, that said, I do miss being on the road and seeing everybody. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, there was a balance to the whole thing. I, I, I don't know about you, but do you think the role might change a little bit after that you might do more events online and balance it out with travel because travel is going to be, I mean, I don't know, I'm guessing, it's going to be more expensive. It's going to be a little bit clunkier to travel. There was a new 
uh, report out by Simon Caldwell, the travel journalist today, and it, it looks like it's going to be not so straightforward. I mean, it's speculations, but at some point in the future, we'll be traveling the way we were, but it's going to take time. So what do you think? Yeah. It's going to take time. I mean, we've not necessarily got a travel ban, but we do have to get sign off for any travel that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the biggest difficulty for the next year or so is going to be justifying it, because even if travel opens up again, um, the events halls that we go to are not going to be open to full capacity. And even if they were, I don't think everyone's going to want to travel to a show again as they normally do. So from our end, being able to justify going to a festival with half as many people, and the cost of travel going up, that's going to be pretty tough. Um, and I think everyone's going to find that. But like you say, we'll eventually go back to travel the way we were. But I think what will happen is, um, and, and maybe people that go to tastings and festivals don't see this, but wh when I'm in another country and you come and see a tomato tasting at seven o'clock at night, I've not been go visit, doing tourism stuff during the day you know we're visiting stores we're doing trainings for bartenders we're doing trainings for uh, retail outlets or doing media things I think that element will move more digital mm. um if, if I, I I've never worked in a bar but if I was working in a bar and I was told you need to come in on Monday on your day off for this training I wouldn't be so happy about it but if they said mm. this training's going to be on on Monday uh, here's the Zoom details. I, th I think that's a better way for everybody. The um, platform's there for it, so yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I think the training aspect of it and what maybe goes on behind the scenes will have more of a digital role. But I think in terms of, I don't think the importance of going to a whiskey dinner or going to a festival is ever going to go away because no. it's great, but it will never get past the human element. And I think even as good as this is, it makes you want that human element that much more. Yeah, absolutely. You, do, you miss that contact, don't you? And chatting with yeah. people, meeting like-minded people. Um, no, that's interesting. Um, and so, so great. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so pleased that you did start the Digital uh, Whiskey Festival. That, that brightened up my lockdown for sure. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so I, I know, we obviously know you're the brand ambassador, global brand ambassador for Tomatin, but we want to know a bit more about you. So I know you're from the Highlands. Where were you born? So I was born in Rigmore Hospital in Inverness. Mm -hmm. um, so Inverness, capital of the Highlands. Um, but I grew up in a small village about 20 minutes north called Evington. Um, oh. Now, Evington is not on anybody's radar. I actually used to have a distillery, Glen Skia Distillery, until oh. I think like 1923. Um, but to put it into whiskey terms, it's four miles away from Allness, where I currently am, where I currently live. And that's where Dalmore and Tinnanich distilleries are. So it's kind of All Ness's little brother, uh, just okay. slightly to the south. I was in All Ness two summers ago. We had a we hired a type of a castle there with some friends. It was amazing. You just oh, really fantastic. Needed to see. Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. part of Scotland. Then, so is that so? That's where you live now in All Ness. Yeah, yeah. So the the drive to work is a part. It's a it's a thirty mile part of the North Coast Five Hundred. You know, so sometimes I do when you get beautiful weather like we've been having, and you're you're going for a drive along the Cromarty Firth, and you're going to work. Um, you, you do have to pinch yourself and remember that some people spend their life savings to go and see your commute, which is ridiculous. I, so I know you're right. Um, people travel far to be on that route, and. Um, Stunning, but you know what? I used to like because I live in Campbelltown. We had the A eighty three along the entire coast. I quite liked yeah. it in the, in the wet and the wind as well. You do get that spectacular scenery at that time yeah. too. Yeah, it's it's that's it's you do get a lot of those days where it's brilliant to be inside with a hot chocolate, you know, and and just look out and go, this is it, pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I love it up here. So you've not, so you, so, okay, so Inverness is the area you've been in, well, you were born in, and then yeah. um, you, you're still quite young, actually, I forget that you are, you, you I, I don't know, I'm quite a bit older, but that doesn't matter, but it's just like a really, <laughs> how you are, and you were just 29, you do, I'm not saying you look older, <laughs> but, um, so, so you've been in it, but, but you, you're such a, I mean, well-known figure in the whiskey industry already. So it's great, to, great to see that, and I can see why you're you're great at your job. So your first job Thank in you. whiskey was that at Tomatin? It was, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, to go into all the gory details, I was studying um, 
I, weirdly enough, even when I went to university, I never moved away from the Highlands. I studied at um, the, the University of the Highlands and Islands, which was based at Inverness, um, and I studied Scottish history. Oh, so, perfect. Pretty good, but yeah. never with the intention of getting into distilling. And like I've said to people so many times, when you grow up so close to these distilleries, you they just become another building. You, you kind of overlook them and when you've not got any knowledge of what goes on there, it's just another thing, you know. Um, so never with the intention of getting into whiskey. Um, I, in fact, wanted to be either a teacher or archivist or something to that effect. Wow. But between my third and final year at university, um, every other summer I'd been a van driver. And I said to myself, it would be quite good to get something related to what I'm studying. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that um, Tomatin were looking for an intern for eight weeks to research the distillery's history. Um, Tomatin's oh. developed quite a lot in the last 10 years. This is back in, this is 2012, so eight years ago. Um, but before 2010, 11, the brand only really had two products, three products, very little limited editions. Oh. It was, there was no brand story, so to speak. So, um, they, I, I was lucky enough to get that job and spent the next eight weeks researching Tomatin's history. Um, and in my last day, I was all set to say my goodbyes. I went to the visitor centre, picked up a bottle of whiskey and had thoroughly enjoyed it. And over that eight weeks, had fallen in love with whiskey, you know, started going to tastings and actually applied for, this is, I'll come back to this because it's very weird. I applied for a job in the visitor centre in Dalmore and never got it after this eight weeks. <laughs> And it was the best thing that could have happened because uh, at the end of the eight weeks, um, Stephen, who was the sales director at the time, is now the managing director, asked if I would like to stay on while I finished my degree for a couple of days a week and um, just learn different parts of the, the whiskey industry. And I had been working in Morrison's part time at that point. So I was willing to do anything to get out of the supermarket. Um, yeah. and over, over that next year, when I was finishing my degree, um, I would go down to Tomatin on a Monday and Tuesday, um, would work in the marketing team for a couple of months, then moved into production for a few months, then back into the sales team for a few months. And this was all with the intention of, if I passed my degree, becoming the distillery's brand ambassador. But then in the May that year, um, my colleague who looked after Europe at the time left the company. And um, this is when Stephen said to me, uh, how would you fancy looking after sales for Europe. Mm -hmm. so with my background in studying history, I, I felt, yeah, no course, that's no problem. Yeah, I think I'd maybe sold a couple of books at a car boot sale when I was younger. <laughs> sure, I, can, I can manage a continent. Um, <laughs> so the, for the first couple of years of that were very much learning from the other guys in the team and then eventually became the sales manager for Europe, which is now the job that Nigel does. Yeah. Um, because, and, and you know yourself, that when you're working for these small companies, you don't just have one hat, you know, you're the sales manager for Europe, you're also the brand ambassador for Europe. Mm -hmm. So I convinced myself, because it was a small company, I was getting to do all these things. I think I'd convinced myself that um, this was all part of that commercial role. And I just really wanted to pursue that. So I was approached at that point by White and Mackay of oh. Dalmore asking if I would like to join them to um, work in their sales team. And I, I took the job. I took a job working at White & Mackay, looking after what was termed venture markets. And it was um, pretty much all of the, um, the Russian states except Russia. So it was Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Georgia, all these. You'd be um, Scott checking in, Kazakhstan, Scott checking in. <laughs> yeah. well, you're yeah. never see him again. <laughs> well, it, it was crazy, crazy places to go but I thoroughly enjoyed it and places oh. like Israel as well you know unbelievable places to go the, you would never no one would ever say oh I'm going on my holidays to Kazakhstan you know no, uh, but for, for all for all the good he's done Sasha Baron Cohen's not done a lot for the Kazakhstan image with Borat um but it was a great a uh, great experience oh. but over that year at White and Mackay it was a very very commercial role you know it was you're there to sell um, and I just missed speaking to people about whiskey. I missed the the shows. I missed the that side of things. And um, long story short, I ended up going for a curry with a couple of guys from Tomatin and um, 
Stephen, who was going to become an MD at that point, said, well, in a couple of months, we'll be looking for a global brand ambassador. Would you be interested? And so after a few beers and a few drams, I had a new job. Um, But at the same time, you know, my wife was pregnant. So I had to go in a couple of days later and say to Stephen, you know that job I've accepted? I don't know how much I'll be able to travel because my wife's pregnant, you know? Um, And that's when he said, oh, well, that's quite good because as well as doing the ambassadorial stuff, we also want you to get involved in the whiskey making side. We want you to be involved in the cask selection and blending side. Oh, that's a dream job. It is a dream job. So although my job title is Global Brands Ambassador, a lot of what I do, and I think probably the reason that I've not been put on furlough, uh, as a lot of ambassadors have, is that I'm also, the best way to put it right now is that I'm just watching over Graham Yunson's shoulder all the time and trying to pick up anything, um, any information in that. So, mm-hmm. quite a lot, which is fantastic. Um, I get to work on some of her blends quite a bit. So just picking away at that and learning as much as possible about that, because I think eventually, as I start to dial back the amount of traveling I do, I would like to be doing more of that um, yeah. making side of things. Especially when you you have a young family and it's, it's nice to be able to spend a bit more time with them. But Because uh, when you are in full swing of that global brand ambassadorial role, you're not home much. I mean, I, I know Stuart Buchanan, I spoke to him, he, he's barely in the UK. Yeah. And you're the same, I know, in and out, and Dun- Gordon Dundas as well, just everywhere. Yeah, so, I, th- I think I, I definitely have it a little bit better than those guys because they go mad for it. I mean, they're, they're, they're away all the time. I would say for me, um, in an average month, I'm maybe away 10 days to two weeks, which is a lot, you know, especially when you've got a, a young son to, yeah. to want to play with and stuff no, like that. Um, it is a lot, but um, it's definitely not quite as bad as some of those guys have it. No. Um, so I'm glad for that as well. Oh, well done you and and people know you as well. I mean, I'm Swedish. I know lots of Swedish whiskey geeks that are they know you and they're quite chuffed that I'm speaking to you today as well. So oh, fantastic. It's nice. It's a it's it's a great job, and I I didn't realize that you were involved in the blending side of things as well. So yeah. from that point of view, you you've basically got my dream job. <laughs> what it's 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 quite good at the moment. I'm enjoying the fact that it's not part of the job title because it means that. You know, I think when you speak to a blender or a master distiller or something like that at a show, it's you, they never hear any negative feedback. You know, everyone's always giving them positive stuff. Whereas for me right now, I'm able to present products that I've had a hand in. I'm not saying that on any of them I've had full authority. They all go past Graham Munson and stuff. I've just been able to work on that team and it is a big team. Um, but it is nice to get honest feedback that way, you know, because when people think, he's the ambassador they're quite willing to oh. to shun a product and stuff and that's People good feedback. Are so honest, especially when they've had a jam <laughs> yeah yeah they always like the previous release much better than that one and it's just of course of course yeah 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 happy? but they, weirdly enough they always want to know what's coming up next as well yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> <It's just laughs> <split>. so <laughs> you just have to please them in any way like yeah are you yeah. having a jam no uh scott I'm actually having a beer tonight, uh, just after being out in the garden, it's been roasting hot, I needed a nice cold beer tonight, and I was on um, the lag chat yesterday with uh, Andy and the guys, so I had a a couple of drams there, and I've got one tomorrow night as well, so I'm going to take Monday off this week, I think. Yeah, I think that's that's probably not a bad idea. Um, I'm having a little malt today, because... I stood on my scales this morning and I wanted to cry so bad. I, I haven't picked up any skills. I've picked up weight, so much weight. Yeah. So I've, today was my first day of what they call the 5-2 diet. <laughs> okay. So you're on a, like you starve yourself for two days. So whiskey is allowed in my head. So, um, this that. is so that's why I'm having a big drop. <laughs> I, I feel like that is the sort of diet that I could go for. What, what are you drinking? <laughs> this stuff. Fantastic. Well, I really weird. like it. That was one of the products that I had quite a heavy hand in. So I was going to uh, ask you. That. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things I love about this. And I think I have said to you how I'm a big fan of this bottle. Coming from my background is obviously the Springbank and the J&A Mitchell family. Her packaging is more um, <laughs> something to keep your whiskey inside. Okay, let's say yeah. that way. Uh, I've always been partial to decent packaging. I really love the Aaron new stuff. I love yep. this kind of thing, art bags, tin. Oh, yeah, I think that's awesome. really cool. Yeah. 
yeah. and I love your bottle. It's tactile. I love the way it feels. And um, and w when let's talk about what's inside. I'm so um, I've never tried anything that was matured in the um, in black uh, in in a stout cask before. So that was so nice. Yeah, uh, it works really well yeah. with marsala wood because it is is it marsala? Sorry, uh, Moscatel. Moscatel. It works really nice though with the sweet savory and then yeah. the blackness of this peat of the of the ale. Oh, sorry, of the can't read of the stout. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was a, it was a really cool one. So with Kubalkin, um, we only make it for a couple of weeks a year in the winter, very lightly peated. And the way I like to refer to the distillery at that point is not to Matt and Distillery making Kubalkin. It's Kubalkin Distillery. Everything changes for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, and then what we do, because we are only making a small amount of it, we only make one uh, core product and that's Signature. And then everything else we fill into a wide variety of casks. Mm. And we will explore those casks in and of themselves. Kubokin lets us take it that step further and take what we know about those flavours and kind of go back to our blending roots. You know, mm -hmm. Tomatin was a big blend supplier for a long time. So we get to marry these casks together. And I guess that's where it gets a bit experimental. So, yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's the first whiskey that's married um, Moscatel casks. Uh, we got those from Bacaloa, uh, who are a Portuguese Moscatel producer and um, Imperial Stout Casks from the Black Isle Brewery, which is halfway between where I am right now and Tomatin Distillery. And it's about three quarters of the Moscatel and then one quarter of the Stout Cask. It works so well. It's, um, it's, it's sweet, but yet it's got that leathery sort of darkness that I really enjoy. It's, it's quite, a, I know it's not coastal, but for me, it's got a bit of a coastal remembrance there as well, but that's probably just that leather. Love it. Yeah, it's 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 um for me the, the the way that I like to talk about it is uh like a continental breakfast, you know. It's that sitting outside in a wee cafe in Rome, having a little pastry with some marmalade on it and an espresso. It's yeah. those sort of sweet and bitter uh, Yeah, theory. I hear you. That's it. Yeah. And it's it just um and I like it because um it's a bit you can sit and have a wee think about it, but it's also quite pleasant and you don't have to think too exactly. much about it. Just exactly. it, it puts the spot. No, I love yeah. it. So, um, great. So, see, with whiskey, you obviously, as a student, studied history, you were saying, and uh, yeah. I'm sure you frequented bars, but was whiskey your go-to drink back then, or was it not something you were interested in? It, it's weird. It kind of all happened very quickly at the same time, and I kind of try and figure out what happened first, the sort of drinking whiskey or the knowing about it from the industry side. Um Growing up where I did, there was always whiskey about and probably drunk some when I wasn't meant to, shall we say. Um, but that, um, that, it wasn't even necessarily that I didn't enjoy it. I just wasn't ready for it. Um, yeah. And it was a few years later, I was in a local pub with a friend and um, we ordered, It was I, I remember vividly, it was a Jura superstition, was mm -hmm. that first whiskey that made me kind of think of whiskey in a different way. Mm. And I'm never, I can never quite remember in my head, was I already working at Tomatin at that time? Or yeah. was it just before I started working at Tomatin? Um, but certainly in that eight weeks when I was doing the internship, that's when I really got into whiskey and started going to tastings when I could. And um, So it all ca kind of happened really quickly. It went from not to 60 really fast. Yeah. I feel like I almost missed out on that. Um, that kind of exploring stage that a, a whiskey fan has because I was getting to do it for work. So it, it became novice to knowing probably too much very quickly. Yeah, so you were kind of spoiled from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have, um, if you can't pick a tomato or a kibokan, do you have a go-to rum? Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Love an Aaron. Yeah. Um, I, I think... I I, I'm always on a budget, but you know what? I really love their ten. That's perfect for my budget. Good stuff. I, I mean, I there's there's a lot. I mean, and it, it's always that time and place and things like that. I love White and Mackay, thirteen year old blend. Um, but something I think what it is about Aaron is as as it is with all whiskey is the people. Um, they've got a great great team. They remind me a lot of the team at Tomatin and the way that everyone works together in a close knit team, yeah. and. Um, it just so happens that I'm good mates with Andy and there's quite a lot of bottle swaps going on. So I would say that out with Tomatin and Kubokin, I've got more Aaron in the house than I have of anything else. But 
Um, well, it does help. Yeah, I, the personality I, I, shines through. Sorry. It does help because the personality shines true. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, no, I'm a big Aaron fan. Um, things like Buna Havin as well. I, I, there's nothing I want. There's nothing I want try. Um, there's things that I'll maybe not reach back to so often. But yeah, no, I, I, I love what the guys at Compass Box are doing. I have done for a long time as well. So um, just from that sort of whiskey geekery point of view, it's quite interesting. Yeah, and from your blending um, well path as well, where you're learning about blending. Yeah. Um, so when you were your first uh, uh, stint, shall we say, at, at Tomatin, you lived at the distillery, is because I think they do like staff um, quarters can you, or, or yeah. accommodation. Yeah. So how was that? I, I mean, well, that was fantastic. I think most distilleries that were built around that time had a level of housing. You know, this is 1897 Tomatin's built, and you look at a lot of distilleries from them that time, and there are um, staff houses on site. Mm. Um, and uh, it just so happens that as the Matin developed, the number of houses grew. And unlike a lot of distilleries who sold the houses on the private market to get money back, we never ever did that. Um, so they still own about 30 houses at the distillery um, and, and rent them out to the staff. And when I say rent, it's you couldn't buy a tent for that amount of money. I think it's mid 20 pounds and as the story that I heard from one of the guys was this was so that the, the staff didn't uh, have a taxable benefit. You know, that was yeah. almost the minimum that they, they could charge to get around that. So uh, if anyone from HMRC is watching. <laughs> um, no, so so it's, so I, I when I started working at Tomatin full time, um, I just sort of threw it out there. I said, you know, if, I mean, I was 22 at the time. Um, I was engaged to my now wife, but we were, we're both living with our parents. Yeah. And I just sort of said, you know, if there's a house going, I would love to be considered for it. And within, I think, about a month, I was living in Tomatin. Um, it's so, a whiskey geek's dream, that whole thing, yeah. I can imagine. And you're right in what you're saying. I mean, having worked at Glendronach, there's a beautiful beautiful houses their managers buildings and then deputy managers buildings they're fantastic but they're more used to um used now for um not better breakfast but they use them to rent them out for when people are visiting the distilleries That's and other right. distilleries are turning their their accommodation into visitor centers or a, like an experience room so it's unusual that they're kept as um you know for living in really as, yeah. as you are i think as well when we've got so many of them it would be impossible to use them all for some sort of commercial purpose. So yeah. one of the, the oldest houses has been turned into office space now. Yeah. But other than that, they're still all rented out to the, the to the staff, which is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we there. There. Sorry. yeah we, we lived there for four years, which was yeah. great. You know, as a young couple trying to save up for our own place eventually, that was just... Uh, a brilliant, brilliant thing to have and a beautiful place to live as well. I can imagine, beautiful. And, and did anything ever go on? Like what, what, what if you had to, like, did, I suppose you weren't in production as such, but could anything happen? You don't distill 24 hours, do you? So there would have been like no, many instances. Well, we do um, 24 hours for four and a half days a week. So it's not 24 seven, it's um, Monday till, early Monday morning, right through till Friday lunchtime, the, the yeah. distilleries in production. but. Do you know what? I, I think if you ask anybody who works in a distillery or lives near a distillery, if nothing out of the ordinary happens, it's very, very good. Um, and that was very much the experience that I had at Tomat. And there was not, the, I never saw any fires or saw people having to run into work or anything. Um, it, it was quite bizarre though, because the house that I lived in was right off of the, the road that goes past. So on a Sunday morning, you would have um, backpacker buses coming in and everyone's <laughs> looking into the house and things like that. And you're trying to watch, you're trying to watch the football and things. So that was a little bit bizarre. Uh, it was almost like being in a, a weird sort of whiskey zoo for a while, but um, you get used to it. Um, that, and it's, it's a weird thing, you know, there's, there's not a pub in Tomatin. So you never really oh. had any of those crazy stories about the other people that you work with. Everyone very much uh, keeps themselves to themselves until you need a hand. And if you're trying to dig out a car in the snow, someone will come out and give you a hand and things like that. So it's just that lovely sort of dependable community feeling. And I can only imagine like, um, so the people that you work with are in effect your neighbours, like some of our neighbours are our best friends. And 
it's it just you, you have a, a deeper relationship and that, that just makes it everything a bit nicer doesn't it you, you have yeah that. I, I think as well that there is an element of you, you think twice about falling out with somebody because it's not just from nine to five. It's when you, you go home as well. Now I was, I was in the position that most of the people that I uh, work with day to day were the, in the office and um, most of them lived in Inverness or nearabouts. Um, the, the production team that did live on site, I didn't have every day nine to five contact with them, but you did get that sense that everybody at work was just that little bit, pallier because they knew people more it was just like working with your neighbors which was which feels great yeah i can imagine no it, it's uh, it's it's lovely i like i like that i do think that brings a certain different like element into the the team and the work spirits and, and also to the spirit to be honest it's nice yeah. that i have that um i have to confess and i i'm embarrassed to say it but i have never taken the turn and come to see your distillery. I've been past mm. it a few times and I yeah. never stopped. Uh, I've always been on my way somewhere, either Glendronach or Glenglasa or, you know, I've been on or in Alness and I yeah. am sorry, but I have sent That's people cool. there, plenty of people. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it's, it, the, the, the location of it is almost a benefit and a curse in that situation because, you know, you get a lot of people coming in for a tour that otherwise wouldn't have gone to Tomat and they, it's maybe not something they would have looked out for, but yeah. they see the sign saying distillery and they're like, oh, let's go in there. But then the people that probably do like distilleries but are going somewhere, because it's so close to Inverness, I think people just quite often think 15 more minutes and we're there, you know. Yeah. Um, but next time you're up that way, let me know and uh, we'll, oh. we'll get you around. Absolutely, because uh, I'm, I'm due over, well overdue a visit. I had a group uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, time flies, and there was a whole bunch of them, and they, Tomatin was one of their stops, and they had a lot of distilleries on their, I, I set up their itinerary, it was a group from Sweden. And they right. said that, that was uh, the best. They said they really oh, enjoyed good. it. I can't remember good. who guided them around, but they had such good, uh, I think it was just a feeling of it. It's just that being looked after, uh, getting to try stuff uh, from the cask and just, yeah, they were amazed by it. So I want to come up. I want to come up. Good, good. perfect. Um, <clears throat> so talking about products, so I'm trying to keep off in there. Um, but what about the new releases? I saw, I seem to remember a 21-year-old Martin for GTR. Was it Global Travel? Yeah, that yeah. So we, we started, uh, I think maybe 2016, 2017, developed a travel retail range which has our core 12-year-old in a litre format, and then an 8, 15, and 40-year-old that are all exclusive to travel retail. Oh, but, okay. earlier this, but earlier this year, we, um, you know, <laughs> things were going so well with travel until earlier this year. And uh, actually about two weeks after we launch this 21-year-old, everything stops. Anyway, we released this uh, a 21-year-old for global travel retail, and it's just a great example of a... a it's a no fuss sort of whiskey. It's fully matured in first fill bourbon barrels, which I guess you could say 21 years fully matured is quite a long bourbon maturation. Normally you'd be maybe looking to get some refill casks into that, but it's just a stunning, stunning whiskey. It's got all of that tomato and baked apples and pears, but with that lovely vanilla ice creamy uh, spices going on as well. So yeah, really, yeah. really nice. Oh, I, that sounds like a, I love a bourbon matured whiskey. First fill, uh, that sounds like my whiskey. I must try and look out for that then when I, whenever I'm in an airport next in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And um, then the, the other one we released around about the same time was, um, I've only got an empty carton now, but decades yeah. too. So um, oh, back, in, back in 2011, we released a whiskey called Decades. Um when Dougie Campbell retired after, well, he was in his 50th year, so married together whiskey from the last five decades. And then this year, um, Graham Yunson, who is uh, Dougie's successor, was promoted to um, Master Distiller. So we did that again. And um, I know it's a little, it's backwards on Instagram, yeah. is it maybe? But, but I think when um, they see it, it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got all the wow. information on the ages yeah. and that in there as well. And, Goes right back to whiskey from the seventies all the way through what, nineteen seventy three right through to two thousand and thirteen, and it's just were you incredible. Involved in that? Were you involved in doing the ta tasting the samples and that? Yeah, bits and pieces in that. I mean, that was very much Graham Yunson taking the lead with that because it was a celebration type of piece. But um, what, one of my favourite memories was um, 
and we were tasting the so Graham had done his nosing and tasting with the samples and decided what casks he wanted to use and then vatted them together and as is often the case the final vatting is not exactly what was in your 100 mil sample bottle um so we were nosing it and it was beautiful it was exactly what you get in the bottle right now but we tasted it and it was a, a bit more tannic than we expected um the the casks from the 2000s used in there are french oak casks uh -huh. um so there's quite quite a lot of tannin in there yeah um but it was a brilliant thing because graham said go and get me two more um from i think i think it was two more from 1977 and uh one more from 1995 you know so it was just a case of it, let's make this whiskey brilliant rather mm. than worry about the fact that we've used two casks that we maybe didn't need to, to, to use um so it was a, a brilliant brilliant thing to be part of that and hear that conversation and his sort of yeah. approach to that and nice that you care about it as well you don't just go well we've already marketed let's just stick it out there you want to make sure it's actually the way you want it yeah yeah well actually one of the things as well was we had kind of prepared all the press material with the number of casks that we were using and then we had to call and say we've actually thrown a couple more in yeah. and things so that's um, a good story. That just shows you, being a small distillery, that you have that facility and you can do that. It's not like exactly. all locked in a system where you can't change or go back and fix it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it would have been, I'm sure it would have been a lovely whiskey without that addition, but it just, it, it felt like the right thing to do. And yeah, really I'm glad is. that it was done because it's beautiful whiskey now. So, yeah. So, talking of the 1970s, that's my decade, by the way. Um, what, what do you have in your warehouse? What's the oldest? So the oldest we've got is we've got a little bit left of 1967. Oh, um, wow. So we've got a little drop from there, and like like all distilleries, no nothing is extensive, but we've got stock from most years from 67 right through to the current day. Mm. Um, we were very lucky that well we're, we consider ourselves very lucky now that in the 1970s we were the biggest distillery in Scotland. Um, oh, so really. Yeah, yeah, 1974 or 76, uh, 74, sorry, we had grown to have 23 stills um, and a potential output of 12 and a half million litres a year, which until about 10 years ago is Glenfiddich levels, you know, yeah. um, massive. But and it was all been into blends. Then. Sorry. Was that for the blended market then, I take it, yeah? 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we had... Uh, we had a couple of our own products, but they were tiny, you know, sold to Italy, which was booming in malt yeah. at the time. And uh, actually, when Milroy's of Soho uh, moved to single malt, Tomatin was one of the first three single malt whiskeys they had in their store. Aww. So it's a cool little story that I bring up at every Milroy's tasting that I do. Yeah. But um, yeah, but no, the vast majority was being sold to the blenders. Um, so that's meant that there are still we've been able to buy back a lot of the stock that we sold at that time, you know, yeah. so stock that maybe Diageo were sitting on that they had bought in for a five-year-old blend 40 years ago and no longer need, we've been able to buy it back or trade it back. Where the downside lies is in the 1980s when we were put into liquidation. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is when all the other companies started to amalgamate together and they didn't need a third party supplier like us anymore. So um, there's a, a couple of year gaps in the 1980s just by virtue of the fact that we weren't distilling at all. So we'd gone from uh, 12 and a half million liters a year to maybe working one day a month while the liquidators were looking after the distillery. So, um, so that crazy. was a few years in the 80s, yeah? Yeah, and it's, it's testament to I mean, a lot of our staff have been working at Tomatin since the 70s, you know, long, long years of, of working there. So it's testament to them because their house was tied to their job in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and they they were they were going down to working one day a week, one day a month at times and, and just doing everything they could to get through. And thankfully for them, they did. And we were bought by a Japanese company in 1985. And it's been uh, pretty rosy since then. Yeah, and you've been with them since then. It's not been changed any owners or anything. No, so there's been three, um, I guess you could say, it, it was never owned by an individual. Well, yeah. yes. So when it was opened in 1897, it was a sort of consortium of local businessmen. There was one main guy, uh, John McBain from Tomatin. And then in 1906, so nine years later, with the Patterson crash and everything, we were bankrupted. 
and then in 1909 we were bought by a couple of families from London they ran the distillery right through until the 1980s Oh. And then since the 1980s, we've been owned by a Japanese business. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know about the, before the Japanese owners. That's interesting. Yeah. No, I, I, I welcome the foreign um, ownership because I, if we didn't have that, there wouldn't be as many distilleries in Scotland. We'd be really exactly. very few. And um, yeah. it's just, yeah, no, it's it's needed and, and very welcome. Yeah. I, um, so have you got any new releases? I know it's hard to say because where we are at the moment, but what's, any releases that you've had to put on hold or anything that's coming out? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's been a bit of that. We, I, we've seen some other companies put releases out and all power to them because it's not an easy time to, yeah. to sell whiskey, let alone try and communicate new releases with people. Um, I think what, what we're seeing is a massive shift to online shopping at the moment. Mm -hmm. But also, I think a lot of people that would normally walk into a... a specialist retailer have been buying their uh, whiskey from the supermarkets mm. um, so they're not getting exposed to the limited editions that they maybe would if they walked into yeah. a good spirits company in Glasgow or something like that you know yeah. um, we normally put a, a UK exclusive out early uh, so, so spring to early summer so that went on hold um, mm. and normally we'll put out our normal limited release yeah. around about August time, but we've pushed that back. And I think that will probably be uh, into next year now. I think the decision has been made mm -hmm. to focus on our core range. We've we've still got a little bit of stock of decades to go. Mm -hmm. So focus on these things, just do them really well and wait until everyone's in a position where they're ready for whiskey again. I think yeah. right now is a confusing time for everybody. The last thing they need to know is what phenol casks we've used. You know, I think yeah. let's let's wait until everybody's ready for that information. I agree. I think if you're in that position to be able to do that, that's a that's a wise move to do. Um, yeah, I noticed the, the whole sort of, it, it, not just but whiskey, but the drinking habits of people have changed, even within these 12, 14, 15, whatever weeks we've been in lockdown. It started off with beer and wines, and then people started buying, like I'm the same, I've started buying cocktail ingredients. That's not something I would have yeah. bought. Like, and just because I'm playing with it at home with the one other person that we can see uh, now. And it's just changes that change, keep changing. So people are maybe going to be looking for, I'll tell you what, what's probably uh, gone up is the samples, this, the whiskey samples that they're selling. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's a tricky one, though. If you, you probably need to be an independent bottler. There's a sort of legislation around there as well, so I don't understand it all. But you definitely can see more people advertising doing tastings and samples and kits. And for Father's Day, what an amazing gift to be able to give is like, here's a sample kit, but actually you can watch the person that made the whiskey. Exactly. Talk about yeah. it. That's going to be great. Like Kilcoman, yeah. I have watched. Sorry, it's gone. <laughs> I, I loved how James got locked in with uh, Anthony and they've been doing these t tastings every Friday. I know. Brilliant. It's been fantastic. Yeah, yeah. No, they've been, some of the things, like I say, we're getting, um, not only am I getting to see master classes that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to see, but you're getting access to personalities in the whiskey industry that you maybe see go out of the distillery once in a year. So <laughs> hearing from the likes of Anthony or Richard Patterson or things like that, it's it's that side of things is brilliant. And I've been able to take part in a few tastings myself. So I did... Um, one of the our whiskey uh, festival tastings um that becky paskin was running oh, yeah. and then um, and just last thursday connell from adelphi uh, sorted me out with a little pack to an adelphi tasting and right. they've been fantastic um i yeah. I, I, I totally get that I, I still will go and buy a bottle though because i think in order for these tastings to actually work there has to be a commercial reason for it so if if, I, if someone's willing to go through all the effort and hardship of putting a pack together and getting it to me, I'm going to go and buy a bottle um, off the back of that. I think it's the same as if I did go to a real life tasting. Uh, but it has been great to see. Yeah, yeah. I noticed on your website that, because um, normally when you visit a distillery in Scotland, there is an exclusive a bottle that you can only buy visiting uh which yeah. i quite like but charming but obviously the, you can't your distillery is closed for the unforeseen future um and then it's a nice touch that you're saying people can now order those bottles on online can't they that's right yeah so we um we've got five casks at tomatin and actually a couple of weeks ago um 
myself and Graham Munson and uh, Julia from the Kubalkin team and uh, uh, Gregor, who was actually in here earlier on, uh, we sat down and tasted through them on our Friday night session. And I think the, th the thing was for us, you know, we have these distillery exclusives very much uh, as an extension to the tour because they show you something about the whiskey that you wouldn't otherwise see. But they're also a nice little thank you to people who have made the travel to Tomatin. Um, but this year people aren't able to travel to Tomatin and it's not for a lack of wanting to. Um, so it just seemed like the right thing to do to, if, if we weren't going to release any limited editions, like I just said, we're going to put them on hold. It's yeah. nice to have something to talk about and something new for people. Um, and much in the same way that I'm able to go to tastings that I wouldn't otherwise get to, people who maybe wouldn't have been able to get to Tomatin in a normal year are now able to get these whiskies. So yeah. it's, it's a great thing. And, and it's good to see a couple of distilleries have done it. I think like said, Glenn Goyne did it quite early on mm -hmm. as well. Okay, yeah. I hadn't seen it before, but that's interesting. They have done that. Um, yeah. I, I no, I saw that and I thought, what a great touch! That's something that, um, that's a nice thing to do. Because um, there, there, don't forget, people were booked to come. Like I had a bunch of Scots that were coming over for the uh, Campbelltown festival. Right. Yeah. yeah. And people were meant to be coming well, up to Speyside and the Highlands. Yeah, I, I had planned to go to Isla this year. Um, I'd been to Isla oh. a couple of times when I was working at White and Mackay because yeah. you need to go there to get to Jura. <laughs> um, but I'd never actually spent a lot of time on Isla. In fact, most of my time on Isla was flying to the ferry, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get across the island as quick as possible. Um, so I was going to go over. I wasn't going to go over during fish because um, the last thing that is required is another brand ambassador on F Isla during fish Isle. So uh, I just planned to go over at some point, and that's been put on the back burner. Uh, like Roy says on his channel, not cancelled, just postponed for another day. Yeah, it'll be so good when it comes off, like next year or whatever they're doing. Um, yeah. Aaron is, is this weekend Aaron's festival or is it the next weekend? I should probably know that, but I haven't actually looked at the oh, date. I'm not sure. I'm because not they're sure. having their 25th anniversary, so they're doing a big uh, online festival. Um, so that should sure be a good, um, good thing to watch as well. Uh, on social media so look there because I'm obviously not 100% sure uh, yeah. how did it go yesterday I was trying to, I couldn't watch you live you were talking about Pete with Andy Bell from um, uh, Lag or Aaron and yeah. uh, a few others and I didn't I wasn't able to sign on live but I was hoping to watch it um, on YouTube or something so I'm hoping it's going to come up well, was yeah, it, so was it? it was great it's, it's, I think it now sit, that sits on Lag's Facebook channel rather than on Aaron's Facebook okay. channel um, but I think it's on Aaron's YouTube channel or something like that. Um, but yeah, it was it was good. It's it's like all these things. It's good just to have a, a wee chat with some friends. So um, it was myself, Andy, um, James Wills from Kilhoman and Andrew Smith. And it was good just to have a little, little bit of good uh, conversation about a subject that I think a lot of people are interested in, but it can get very, very confusing. So we tried to just kind of cut through any of the the nonsense and kind of say this is what it is this is how it got into whiskey um and this is how we use it individually at our own sites exactly because um, you've all got your own like because Holman being such a peaty whiskey that's the that's the, yeah. like, the heart of their whiskey and uh Kubok and it's that sort of lovely sense of, of peach um yeah. and lag uh, we don't know yet well they probably do know but we we just have to wait and see have you been to lag by the way I've not, I've, I've been to Aaron, I've been to, well, to Loch Ranza, um, yeah. but it's been a couple of years since I've been over to the island. Yeah. Um, but no, it was interesting hearing Andy chat about lag yesterday and some of the conversations that they're having at the distillery. And I think that the, what I get from it is that they're going to be exploring peat in a very unique way. So um, I would love to get over when we can and go, go and see that. Yeah, sounds great. And that's what I love with our industry is that we all encourage each other to come and visit and you get treated like... Uh, like a queen or a king, because you, you know the people. Absolutely. Listen to them. Yeah, yeah everyone looks after everybody. Yeah. So say with Tomatin, that was actually something I was meant to ask you. Uh, do you do everything on site? Do you, do you have do you have warehouses anywhere else, or what? How does it work? Do you have everything at? Uh... So, um, we don't have malting on site. Um, no. I think the last time we malted on site was in the sixties, but when it got to that point of doing twelve and a half million liters a year. There's not enough barley floors in the world for that. So 
Um, and as, as you know, I think Springbank is now the only distillery that still managed to do all their malting on site. Awesome. Um, I think I've, I've heard stories of other distilleries where the marketing team actually pay for the malt floors because it's part of the brand rather than part of the production. Um, so no, no malting on site. Um, we do just about everything else. Of course, bottling's done off site, but we've been having conversations around that. But um, warehousing, all where uh, matured on site. We actually have a ridiculous amount of warehouse space because mm -hmm. It was all put up in the 70s when we were this massive site so yeah. we have we have 13 warehouses um okay. with a capacity of around about a quarter of a million casks um that's so, massive so yeah, you, can, yeah. you can in theory rent some space out if you wanted we do we do yeah <laughs> we, we do i think uh, quite a lot of independent bottlers use uh, oh. the space that we've got um, some new distilleries and even some old distilleries that we've just got really good relationships with. Um, we, we will mature on site for them as well and do uh, racking operations. Another thing to bear in mind is that we still do, um, we still do sell some liquid to blenders and we do our own blends. So there's a lot of whiskey on site that's not tomatin. Yeah. Um, but all the tomatin that we own anyway is matured on site. Um, okay maybe some independent independents or other companies will have moved off site i didn't realize you had that many that much space for warehousing that's great we actually knocked one down last year <laughs> <laughs> there's not many distilleries right now that can say that they're we're in the position to knock a warehouse down but yeah, yeah uh, we had it's the middle of the highlands the, the frost shattering on the foundations was so extensive that we had to get all the casks out and knock that building oh. down so, yeah. did you not by the way, had have a bit of an accident. Like, did did you have too much snow in one year? It burst your your ceiling in from one of the warehouses. Was that your distillery? That no. That I, I know that happened to Glen Fiddick because they released Snow Phoenix off the back of it. I, I I think there have been years where we've had problems with the roofs coming in, um, yeah. but yeah. nothing nothing to the the point of this is a catastrophe and we, we've lost so much whiskey. I think if it did happen, it was quite fortunate that it happened in one of the warehouses with only a few casks in it so uh, but not that i'm aware of nothing maybe not nothing crazy nothing we do crazy. get proper winters up there though it's it's pretty hot yeah, yeah. do you private casks do you bottle sell private casks like um, so we don't sell new fill in the way that lag or Aaron do um for for maturing but we will sell um casks to uh, whether it be an individual a store or a group that want to bottle their own cask they can bottle their own cask of tomato in, in our packaging and things. Um, but yeah, we, we're, we're able to offer casks right back to 1999 in that okay. at the moment. Um, so they just the decide, they don't, they don't buy the spirit and then they pay rent to mature their whiskey. They actually buy the ready whiskey. Correct. Correct. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's so we're company. selling, we're selling effectively. We'll, we'll make a, we'll bottle a tomato and single cask for you and put your, your logo or whatever it may be on it. And that's a really cool thing because it means that you can have a little bit of the distillery right there and now, you know, you yeah. don't have to worry about the, the 10 years of waiting or what the market's going to be like in that time or, or the yeah. tax on the end. We give you a case price and that's it. Right. Well, I have learned so much about Tomaston today. I couldn't believe it. Uh, lots I didn't know. So thanks for that. Uh, and yes, like Whiskey Deer says there, I guess it gives you more control on quality, which is true. Big thing and about I, that, yeah. That was the main reason for it, really. Uh, well, uh, so I've, had, I've got a timer today, which is why my eye keep going down there. This is the first time I'm using a timer, and I'm so sorry, to, because I have been <laughs> terrible with my timekeeping. Uh, I, uh, one last question for you, Scott. Have you got a favourite yeah. Scottish word? I always like asking Scottish people that. So... I, my favourite Scottish word is actually more of a noise than it is a word. And it's something very local to this part of Scotland. And it's two sharp breaths in. So it goes like, <laughs> and that's it. It's just, <laughs> and it, it's very much um, a sign of agreement. So if someone's, ha if you're speaking to someone and you're telling them something and they're going, yep, yep. We'll just go. <laughs> ah! And uh, Never heard <laughs> that. The reason that I love it is my mum does it all the time and she doesn't notice it. And my wife and my mum work together, so I sometimes feel like they're ganging up on me. But I was engaged to my wife before she asked, does your mum like me? I was like, 
what are you talking about? And she's like, every time I tell her something, she makes this weird breathy noise. And even where my wife's from in Invergordon, they don't have this part of the dialect. And she just thought that my mum so much for me bragging about having a timer, Scott. That was not good. <laughs> shouldn't have mentioned that. On <laughs> it was at the end. Of, oh my god! <laughs> yeah. oh, and I can't yeah. edit these. I'm, I'm sure I can, but anyway, that that um, <laughs> that's by the by. I love that. So your wife was saying, "Sorry, you need to continue from there." So, so my wife just thought that my mum was incredibly bored of her because every time my wife would be speaking to my mum, she would say. <gasps> Uh, and that, that, I guess, is my, my favourite Scottish-ism, if you want. It's not really a word, but it has a lot of meaning to it. It carries a lot of weight. It's, it, that, but that's a great, because it's obviously quite a Highland, Scottish Highland thing to, to go, <laughs> I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> where my, uh, they're in the north of Sweden, um, they, instead of sort of being an affirmative answer, saying yes, they do a breath in as well. They go, and that means... Okay. That, that means yes. So do you want some coffee? And that means, and my dad does that. So what? I sometimes I look under the bed and I'll ask him a, a yes question and he can hoover for me because he just goes. <laughs> now that's, that's really interesting. And it, th this is a, a bit geeky, but um, Douglas Cook from Ben Reich, I was I was speaking to him because he's a master of languages. He knows so many. And um, we were talking about the Doric, the dialect in Aberdeen. And Aberdeen have this breath in as well. The, you know, so they have that. And uh, I was speaking to him about it. And he was telling me that um, Aberdeen was a Viking trade route. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of um, Doric terms that are very similar to Swedish. So and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to confirm them because if not, he's been on the wind up with me. But in, in Aberdeen, if your baby's crying, the burn is greeting. Yeah. And, am I right in saying it's burn a gruta? Yeah, Gota, yeah. And, uh, well, he's absolutely right. Yeah, um, if you're moving house, it's a flitting house, and in Sweden it's flitta husa. So. Scott, <laughs> you're amazing, you know Swedish. No, not at all. I know how to move house and uh, have a crying baby. So, <laughs> uh, When I lived in, in Campbelltown and you drive down the Kintyre Peninsula, there's a couple of villages called Tarbert. There's one with Tarbert with an R and one Tarbert. And that, they, both these villages are in the thinnest land strip of, well, strip of land on the Kintyre Peninsula. And that's because in Viking or Scandinavian language, Tarbert means take boat. So that's where the Vikings would lift the boat over the land. So that's Tarbot, right. Tarbert. So that's how oh, that name came around. I, yeah, I just, I, it's fascinating. I, I love all this because there's uh, the town uh, near us kind of halfway between Allness and Inverness, but away out the way, it's called Dingwall. And this is oh. where this uh, this uh, very Chuk tourisms come from. So that comes from Dingwall <laughs> in that area. And Dingwall, uh, it was the site of a Viking thing, a uh, ting. Uh, so that's where that comes from. So I wonder if that's where these dialect things come in. It's fascinating to know, but uh, no, I love all these things. But yeah, so that's, that's my favorite Scottish, or as we now know, Scandinavian uh, word. <laughs> Well, who knows? We're very closely related. Well, that's a good one. Thanks for that. It's one that I, well, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> but funny, we were just, Kibo, I used Kubokan in a Viking tasting I did once. Uh, somebody asked me to do a, a Viking relation tasting. So now, obviously, Highland Park is in there. And yeah. um, and I also threw in Torfa from uh, Glenglasa. Torfa means uh, it's peat in Scandinavian yeah. or in Nordic. And Kubokan is wild dog. Is it? It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's meant to, it was originally a ghost dog or spirit dog. So that was a, a local tale uh, close to where the distillery is that yeah. found its way into, into the bottle. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, that's, that's why I learned a little bit about, about the, um, the whiskey. So pleased to have done that. And um, I think, I mean, <laughs> sorry, that was such an abrupt finish there, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> I'll tie them together nicely. Uh, thank you so much, Scott. I I'll let you get back to your family now. That was thank kind you for of... having me. I feel I feel like this week I'm, it's a little bit like being the guy at a rock show who makes sure that the drums are working between the two bands. You had Frank McCarty yesterday and Alex Bruce tomorrow. I'm just glad to be having a chat with someone about whiskey amongst these two legends. So about fantastic. Frank, I mean, he sixty years, fifty-seven years in the industry. 
unbelievable. That's and he he managed to figure out Instagram Live as well, which is even more. He joined Instagram just to be on the interview. (laughs) (laughs) He never was on it before. No, I'm so pleased. It's just uh, people that I feel comfortable making a fool out of myself in front. (laughs) You're one of them. (laughs) Oh, fantastic! Yeah. (laughs) And then tomorrow, like you said, I'm speaking to Alex, and that's going to be really cool about Arne Merkin and. Well, well, I'd like to say I was, I was on a, a Delphi tasting last week and there was an Ardna Merkin sample in it and it was absolutely outstanding. I cannot wait till they, I know they've bottled their AD spirits and I've tried those as well, but I can't wait to get a bottle of their whiskey because it's well, unbelievable. That's what I'm going to ask him. I don't know how much he's going to be able to tell me, but you know how they were, I think they were meant to be bottling their six-year-old now, like were they not? Some, I think it's I think it's coming soon from what I could tell. Okay. Yeah, I think it's coming yeah. soon. I hope I hope they've got something about me. I can't wait to try it. So looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for everybody that's been watching. And uh, nobody sent any questions in. And if they do, I missed them. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that I've just looked at I think I have most of my questions asked and I've learned so much about you yeah. and tomato. Thank you, Todd Scott. Well, thank you for having me on. Cheers. Have a good night. Cheers. Yeah, Bye. Bye.